Well, good morning, church. We're so happy that you're here. Whether you're joining us here in person or online, we want to say welcome. We're so excited to be in this Christmas season, and I hope all you guys are all excited just along with us. We're about to go into a time of worship, and so we just want to encourage you to sing with your loudest voice, and let's give glory to God.
stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire i'll rejoice cause you're there too speaks of something that's very important for us to understand. It talks about the altar of your life. And it's extremely important to realize that what God is looking for from us is just not the works that we do or just simply trying to be a good person. He wants our will. He wants our heart. And that's what an altar is all about. An altar is all about sacrifice. It's about laying yourself down and saying, God, what I want in my life more than anything else is I want what you want for my life. And I'm laying aside everything that represents my will and my purpose. And I want you to fulfill everything that you want for me in my life. Jesus taught us to pray that. He said, pray that the kingdom of God would come and the will of God would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That includes your earth, your world that you live in. And so there's a wonderful thing to realize as well that when we surrender to God, and that's really the key word, it's surrender, it's giving up to God, it's letting go of our own life, letting go of our own control and saying, God, I'm letting you have control of me, that when we do that, we're positioning ourselves really for the blessing of God to flow. Oftentimes we're missing blessing in our life because of one thing, a lack of surrender to God. Can I just encourage you this morning as we take this time to pray, this will be your moment to say, God, I'm going to give my life to you. I'm surrendering all that I am to you. Lord, everything's on the altar today before you. And then we're in a position to receive the flow of blessing into our lives as we do this this morning. Join me as we pray together. Father, we love you. May Christ be magnified in our lives today from the altar of our lives. Lord, as we lay down before you this morning, our will, our desires, our purposes, our plans, God, and the control of our lives. We simply give all that we are to you. Lord, all you're looking for is just an open heart to you, a a will that is surrendered to you. You're not looking for all the things we can do. You're looking first and foremost for who we are. You're after us. You want our heart, God. So this morning we come before you and we bring our hearts in worship, our hearts in praise, and our hearts in surrender to you today. Have your will in us today, God. We surrender all that we are to you. Now I pray, Lord, in this moment of surrender that you would do what you always do, that when we surrender to you, you bring blessing to us. Lord, that you meet us in that moment of surrender and you pour out everything that we have need of today, that where we can't find it in ourselves, we find it in you. And so I pray across this worship center and perhaps those that are watching with us online this morning that there would come a flow of healing into our lives. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our healer, that you're our deliverer, that you're the stronghold of our life, that you're the encourager, that you're the comforter, that you're the helper of our soul today. So, Lord, you know the need of every heart and every life. We pray that in this moment that we would be infused with power from on high that we will know that you are here with us this morning, not just in a general sense, but very personally, you're here in every heart and every life to work in every person today because you love us. You care deeply for each one of us. 
So today we honor you and we bless you and we praise you for all that you are. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all the church together said, Amen. Amen. Take a moment this morning. Greet some people around you. Let you know that you're glad to see them in church this morning as we continue in worship together. Welcome to church. Good to see everybody here on the first weekend of December. Isn't that incredible to just realize we're actually into December 2023 and we're so glad that you're here. If you're with us today for the very first time, we're especially glad to have you with us this morning. I'm going to ask all of our regulars to give the warmest welcome to those who are with us for the first time today. We're so glad that you're here and Please do us a favor. If this is your first time, we always love to get to know folks who are with us for the first time. And the way that we do that here at our church is we give you this little bulletin on the way in. You're going to see the bottom right-hand section. Uh, to make it convenient for you, there's a simple QR code right there. And all you have to do is grab your phone. It's a good time to do it right now. Just going to get your phone because there are going to be a few announcements. This is a great opportunity to do it. Grab your phone, scan the QR code. It opens up a connection here with us, and we're going to give you a gift and celebration of you being with us here today. And also at the end of today's service, we always have a meet and greet that happens also that I'll tell you more about in a, in a few moments at the end of my message today. Uh, just one quick announcement on my part. As I said, we are into the Christmas season. And of course, uh, one of our main objectives this Christmas season as a church is to be very generous to our community and outreach. You all did an amazing job over Thanksgiving. We fed so many thousands of people by your giving, by your generosity and your service. Now we have the privilege this Christmas season to do something similar. Our goal is to be able to reach about 6,000 children in our community. This is in Montgomery and Frederick counties. Uh, we have outreaches here at Gaithersburg up in our at Frederick campus in, in Frederick. Also outreaches in Silver Spring and Wheaton as well, where we're actually giving gifts to kids that otherwise would not get a gift, but not just giving them a gift, doing it in the name of Jesus and with the love of Jesus. So when you came in this weekend, you should have received again, as we've been offering you each weekend uh, recently, this little envelope, this card, and on the back, you're going to see how you can actually give. There's a QR code for giving. There's a QR code for serving. Uh, we could use some additional help, especially in Silver Spring and Wheaton. If you're in that area and would like to serve, go to that little uh, QR code, or you can go to church redeemerorg slash holiday outreach or info and get the information as well. If your business is interesting, interested in being a part of this, there's a QR code for your business also. But let's all rise up together for this Christmas season. Let's bless 6,000 kids with the love of Jesus coming from our church. And I know that God's going to help us to do that this year through your faithful giving and through your service. For a few other announcements, look at the screens. Let's watch this together. Welcome to Church of the Redeemer. We're so glad you're joining us today. Yes, we are honored that you would spend part of your day with us. If this is your first time, we would love to connect with you. You can do so in person by visiting meet and greet after service or digitally by scanning the QR code on the bulletin you're given when you came in. Today, we have a very special update that we wanna give you. A few weeks ago, we talked about how we are encouraging and challenging our next generation to give towards the Christmas outreach coming up December 16th. And today, we want to show you how your students and kids have been a part of giving to those in need. It's so amazing to watch young people develop a generous heart for others. In the same way, we want to encourage you to join us as we give to our Christmas outreach. Our goal is to bless 6,000 kids with toys this Christmas. All the information you need to know about giving to the Christmas outreach can be found in the envelope you were given on the way in. Or online at church redeemerorg slash holiday outreach. We have a Christmas invite for you. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will be holding a special service. There are two things I want to encourage you with. First, come join us as we experience the wonder and the fun of celebrating our Savior sent from heaven to earth. And second, don't come alone. Bring a friend or family member. Remember that Christmas is a time where people who don't know Jesus are more open to God and coming to church. We can't wait to see you, your family, and your friends this Christmas Eve at either our Gaithersburg campus at 2, 4, 6, or 8 p.m or at our Frederick campus at 11 a.m. For all the details you need, visit church-redeemer.org slash info.
Your generosity is staggering. Between you giving to the holiday outreaches and your giving to Redeemer, you have touched so many lives. And we want to invite you to keep being generous and to plan for any end of the year giving. This will count towards your 2023 giving as a whole. If God has put it on your heart to give today or to give monthly, you can set up recurring giving at church-redeemer.org slash give. You can also use the MyCUR app or you can use one of the kiosks around the building. We are so glad that you joined us and we are so excited to see how God blesses you today. Let's pray again together. Father, we ask this morning as we study your word that you speak to our hearts. We pray that we would be receptive to the word of God to each one of us today. And we thank you for your word to each one that changes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in welcoming our Frederick campus this morning? Good morning to all you folks at Frederick. So good to see you in church this morning. And of course, again, those who are joining us online on this first weekend of December heading into the Christmas season, we wanted to actually give you a gift this weekend. And so if you're on the left-hand side of the aisle, if you'll reach down and grab the green bag on the left-hand side of the aisle and reach into that bag, and each one of you will pull out this little book. It's called When the Angels Sang. It's a 25-day devotional for you for the Christmas season. Obviously, we've already, uh, this is the 3rd of December, so you'll do a little catch-up on this. And so it's our gift to you. Take one per adult if you don't mind. And of course, all the young people, you're welcome to one as well. And you'll also find inside the book, there's a little QR code, a little card that looks like this. And this will give you access to additional video content for the week as well, or the weeks as well, as we join in devotions together over these next several weeks. We trust that these will be a blessing for you. If you need extra copies or would like to have extra copies, there will be people in the foyer uh, that can help you with that at the end of the service also. So when the angels sang our devotional time together over these next several weeks. Well, today we start a brand new series of messages entitled Help is Here. I want to talk to you this morning about the announcement that changes everything. The announcement that changes everything. Our theme for this month, for this Christmas season, is one simple word, and that's the word help. I'm sure that you've been, if, like, if, you've been, if you're like me, you've been in a situation before where you just needed some help. You were struggling with something or maybe in a situation you couldn't extrapolate yourself from and you needed somebody or something to come along and assist you so you can move, be, move beyond where you were to where you needed to be. And it's a wonderful thing when help shows up in our lives. And Christmas really is all about God stepping into our world to help us. That's really the story of Christmas. And God announced this help to the world in a very unique way to a very unique group of people. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is the announcement of help that came to our world. And we're going to take a look in just a moment at Luke chapter 2 and this amazing announcement of the birth of Jesus. But there are three things we're going to look at together that I think will help us as we focus our attention on Christmas this year. The first thing I'm going to talk about here for a few moments is the fact that God's news is always good news in our lives. One of the, I think, missed messages of the Bible and oftentimes misunderstood messages of the Bible has to do with the nature and the character of God. Sadly, far too many people have a warped perspective of God. They sort of view God as distant or angry or somehow looking for opportunities to judge the world or make people's lives miserable and nothing could be further from the truth. When you study the pages of Scripture, you begin to see a good God who infuses our world with good news. In fact, the whole message of the gospel, the word gospel, as we'll talk about more in a few moments, is the message of good news to us. And so scripture teaches us that our God is a good God and our good God has good news for our world, not bad news for our world, but good news for our world. I could take you to many passages in the Bible, but I will give you just simply one today from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. Give thanks to the Lord. He gives us a reason for giving thanks for he is good and his love endures forever. So it defines for us or establishes for us the nature of God as being a nature of goodness. God is a good God and he always expresses good news to people. And over 2,000 years ago, 2,000 plus years ago, there was a very special announcement that came to the world of the goodness of God. And this announcement came at a very unique place. It came to a field outside a small village named Bethlehem, very near Jerusalem. 
If you've studied or been over to Israel, you will realize that Jerusalem and Bethlehem are very close together in terms of proximity. About six miles separates them. And the video footage that you see on the screen right now is actually the shepherd's field in Israel where I've been multiple times. And in fact, you'll see in a moment, I'm teaching at that moment right in that place and, and just a bit. You'll see as we, we pan down into the valley region, shepherds even to this day taking care of sheep there, tending their flocks. And what we know about this particular group of shepherds to whom this message is given that we'll read about in just a moment, these were shepherds who were likely taking care of the sheep or the lambs that were destined to go to the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. The sacrificial lambs who would be placed on an altar and their blood would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. So they're caring for these lambs that are headed for Jerusalem and for the temple. Now, this place called Bethlehem, although it was a very small little village, it had been spoken of hundreds of years earlier. It was destined for greatness. And in fact, the prophet Micah in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 talks about Bethlehem and the coming events that will transpire there. He says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you're small, you're just a little village among the clans of Judah in the southern part of Israel, out of you, out of you, Bethlehem, will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from, from of old, from ancient times. So hundreds of years before Christ was born, there's this announcement through the prophet Micah that Bethlehem, you've been chosen by God. From, from your place, your location, will come a ruler of Israel. And that brings us now to Luke chapter 2, where these amazing events, this announcement transpires on this very, very momentous night that we see here in Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. These verses are going to be on the screen for you as I read them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to, whom, to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. No one can overstate the importance of what we just read, the importance of this particular event. This moment was the fulfillment of a prophecy, and you'll see many prophecies being fulfilled at this point in time in history, and many more that will be fulfilled through the ministry of Jesus. In fact, some scholars believe as many as 300 prophecies are fulfilled, not only in the birth of Jesus, but in his, in his ministry, his life, his ministry, his death, and in his resurrection. And so this is a very momentous time. It's a moment when prophecy is being fulfilled. And in that moment, in this particular moment of time, God sent an angelic host to make a birth announcement. It's a moment that we are experiencing or we're receiving the most important message to the entire world. The angel said, this message is a message of good news. I'm breaking into society with some good news. And what was the good news? Well, Luke chapter 2 verse 11, as we read a moment ago, tells us what the good news was. Today in the town of David, Notice this, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's the essence of the good news. That the Savior has come, help is here, the Messiah has arrived. The Savior, the Messiah has come. 
Let's talk for a moment about those two words because this is the good news. This good God from heaven above declares through the angelic host, I have good news for you. A Savior has been born. What is a Savior? A Savior, very simply defined, is one who saves, is one who rescues. If you're drowning in the ocean or drowning in a swimming pool or you're in a lake and you're drowning, you're wanting someone that can come in and save you. They can rescue you because you're drowning. You're, you're losing your capacity to sustain life. And so a Savior, a lifesaver, shows up and helps you in that moment. Many of our first responders who are going out in the very difficult circumstances they find themselves in in our society are saving lives many times. That's what a Savior is. But this is not a Savior with a lowercase s. It's the Savior with a capital S. It is the Savior. A Savior has been born. Now, the shepherds understood that Israel needed a Savior. They got it. They understood that. They understood that Israel needed a deliverer. But at the same time that they understood it, they also misunderstood it. Because although they understood that Israel needed a Savior, their misunderstanding had to do with them wanting and desiring a political Savior. They were looking for someone who would throw off the oppression of Rome and free them from the daily struggle they had living under the Roman emperor. And so they were looking forward to a time that they would, quote, be free as a nation. But God comes and says, I have a savior for you. But they failed, at least initially, to understand that their need for a savior was a need for deliverance from something far deeper than political oppression far deeper than just circumstantial oppression. They needed a savior that would deliver them from the most serious oppression of all. And that's the oppression of sin that every human being struggles with, is afflicted by, and experiences in our lives. We all are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. And we all need a savior to save us from our sins. And so there in that moment, although the shepherds thought they understood, only, they would only understand more fully as the ministry of Jesus progressed, but the angel didn't stop in saying he's the Savior. He said he's the Messiah. He's the one you've been waiting on. He's the one that the prophets have spoken through about all throughout the centuries. And in essence, the good news announcement is just simply this. The Savior is here, and that means divine help is here. And everything will be different from this day forward. And in fact, everything has been different from the day forward of the moment that this announcement came to the shepherds in Bethlehem. It divided history in two. Because from that time forward, we speak of B.C., before Christ, and A.D., the year of our Lord. And so the coming of Christ Entering into our world with good news separated history. The most important event that has ever occurred in humankind. Here's the second lesson that I want you to learn today. That we're reminded of from this story. And that's that God's good news is for, is for everyone. It's for everyone. You know, some people have a really hard time receiving good news. Have you ever met a person like that? Maybe you're like that. It's hard to believe that anything good could ever happen to you. And maybe even when you hear good news, you tend to sort of counteract the good news by expecting something bad to happen. It's good right now, but something bad must be on the way. And there are a lot of people that are like that. They have a hard time receiving good news. And what I want you to see is that good news is not good unless you believe it. Good news is only good if you actually accept it. And once you believe it, it has application to your life. It changes everything inside of you, your emotions and your way of thinking and your way of living. Now, in this moment, there were a particular group of people who received this message. And of course, we know that group of people were the shepherds who were taking care of their flocks by night. They're in that field outside of the village of Bethlehem. So the focus of the message, the first announcement of God's sending his own son into our world came to this group of shepherds. Quite unusual if you really understand something about the shepherds because shepherds back in those days were considered to be despised individuals. Oftentimes, they're the outcast of society. 
society. They're, they're thought of as people who are untrustworthy. In fact, many times a shepherd would not even be allowed to testify in court because it was not believed that they would ever tell the truth. And so there's a lot of questions about their character. They're considered to be unclean. But God says, I'm bringing my message into the world. And the first people that I want to hear about my message are those that everybody thinks are unworthy of the message. I'm going to come to those who everybody else says, you know what, well, they don't deserve it, but I'm going to bring my message to them first. I can only imagine being a shepherd there that night and experiencing all this glory, an amazing moment where the angels are singing and declaring glory to God in the highest. And I'm, I'm there, I know I'm a shepherd, okay? I know that everybody else looks at me as an outcast and People look at me as unclean and people think of me as being someone that's untrustworthy and asking myself perhaps the question, why would God speak such an amazing message to someone like me? And perhaps you've thought that in your life as well. Because all of us have a tendency, as the shepherds perhaps would have had the tendency, to disqualify ourselves, to think, you know what, good news is, is wonderful, but it's never really for me. It's good news for somebody else, but I'm not sure if... I can really believe it for myself. And we, we have this tendency to disqualify ourselves based upon our past sins and our past failures. God, you, you certainly couldn't have anything good to say to me because I've been, I've been a horrible mess. My life has been wrecked by my own choices. And maybe some, sometimes you're feeling disqualified by, by your social status, by where you are in the social structure of the world around you. Or maybe you, you have a very extreme dysfunctional family background. You say, well, God certainly couldn't speak good news to me. Maybe you're very insecure in your own self-identity and your, your own worth. And oftentimes we have a tendency to disqualify ourselves and say, you know what? God couldn't really speak to me. Here's what I want you to see very clearly in this passage. Notice again what happens here. But the angel said to them, who, who's, who's the them here? Help me out. Who are they? They're the shepherds. So the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Don't disqualify yourself and be afraid. I bring, what's the next pronoun here? You, referring to the shepherds. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, not just for you, but for all the people. Isn't that amazing that God spoke directly to the group that was in front of him at that moment and says, I'm talking to you, but I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to everybody. This message is for you, but it goes beyond you to any and everyone who will hear and receive the message. So there in that moment, they're able to experience the beauty of this personal communication from God and recognize that God is bringing them in to his fold and bringing them into his understanding. And yet at the same time, recognize it was not just for them. It was for everyone. And what I want to remind you of today is that you're not excluded either. You're included in the good news message. This message of good news is for you. There is no one who is too far gone. There is no one who is too messed up. There is no one who is too distant from God right now. There is no one who has too many strikes against them or has too many bad genes in their life. There is no one who is too dysfunctional or has too many addictions. There is no one who, in fact, has too many failures in their life to be able to experience this good news message that God has for each and every one of us. It's for every social class. It's for every socioeconomic group. It's for every race. It's from any person and every person, no matter what your background might be. It's for the pretty people, and it's for the not-so-pretty people. It's for the smart people, and for the not-so-smart people. It's for the popular people and the not-so-popular people. Amen? Okay. It's for the wealthy people and the rest of us. His message is for all. The Savior has been born. I'm going to give you one other verse here before we go to our third point today because I want you to hear the summation of this in Scripture. What's the last book of the Bible? Does anyone know what the last book of the Bible is? The book of Revelation, right? And so God brings this whole story from Genesis to Revelation and he comes to the last 
chapter of the last book of the Bible, and I want you to see what he said to all of us. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, come. What does this mean? Come to Jesus. Come to faith in Christ. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is the messenger of the gospel, who is the one that draws people to Christ. What's the Spirit of God saying in our world today? Come, come, come to Jesus. Who's the bride? We're the bride, the bride of Christ. And what's the message of the church? The message of the church to the whole world around us, to our communities. Come, come. Come to Jesus. He accepts and will receive anyone who will come to him. He can change and transform anyone's life. No one's disqualified from this message. And so the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears this say, come, let anyone who is thirsty, come, let anyone who desires drink, desires drink freely from the water of life. What word have I circled three times in this passage? It's the word anyone, anyone, anyone. So the same message that was given to the shepherds when Christ was born, this message is to all, is concluded in the book of Revelation with the very same message. This message is to anyone and it is to everyone. Here's the third thing I want you to see today. Help us here. God's good news brings supernatural changes to people who hear and believe it. That's key, hear and believe. Why was this message such good news? Well, it was a message, as I've already mentioned, that help us here. That finally help has arrived. That divine help is on the scene. A Savior has been born. The Messiah is here. It was an announcement of a new work in the world. God said, I'm working in the world now in a way that's fulfilling prophecy. And God has always been at work in the world. That from the time of creation, God has never given up on humanity. From the time that Adam and Eve sinned against God and and turned their back on God and, and resisted God's command, God has been at work redeeming and moving toward this moment in time when Jesus would come and his ministry would be would be fulfilled for you and for me. And so God has been at work in the world reaching out to people. Why? Because God loves people. And so the whole story of the Bible is the story of God reaching to people. We see it unfolding in stages. We see it with the call of Abraham. After the sinful time that God destroyed the world through the flood, and of course there's a rebuilding through Noah and his family, and then ultimately God speaks to a man by the name of Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to go to the land of Canaan. I'm going to make out of you a great nation. Of course, Abraham ends up with a son, Isaac, and then Isaac, Jacob, and then we have the 12 tribes of Israel, and a nation is formed, the nation of God, the people of God, the nation of Israel is formed. They end up in slavery for 430 years. Moses is raised up as a deliverer. And God brings them out of slavery across the Red Sea. And then he leads them to Mount Sinai where there's then the giving of the law through Moses. And there's this moment where God says, now I want you to know who who I am and what I'm like. And I want you to know what holiness is all about. So that you'll be face to face with your own sin. The law is given just to make us aware of the fact that we can't obey it. Okay, we can't keep it. We need a savior. Okay, and so the giving of the law was to be a, a, a prompter to help us to understand how much we needed a savior. And so there's this moment, and then then following the giving of the law, there's all of this history of the Old Testament where we have the times of Israel's prophets and priests and kings and the promise of a coming Messiah. And so as you read the Old Testament, you'll see over and over again the prophets and the priests and the kings and all of those, all the activities of the Old Testament are pointing toward the promise of a coming Messiah, the promise of a coming Messiah, the promise of a coming Savior into our world. It's pointing to the reality of this moment that we just read about just shortly, which leads to what we just read about the birth of Messiah, that Christ comes into our world. God takes on human flesh and enters our world. What an amazing thought that God says, I love you so much that I'm going to actually step into your world. I'll send my only begotten son into your world and the word of God will become flesh and will dwell among you in sinless perfection to redeem you, to save you, to help you and to rescue you And because you cannot rescue yourself. And there's then the birth of Messiah entering our world. Then of course, 
the earthly ministry of Jesus, the Messiah, for three and a half years. He teaches, he ministers, he heals, he delivers, he does incredible works to prove that he was who he said he was. And then we find him in this very moment of his passion, the sacrificial and substitutionary death of Jesus, the Messiah. There's a moment in time when he said, I'm going to fulfill what I came to fulfill. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to take the sins of mankind upon myself. Every sin that's ever been committed or ever will be committed, I'll pay the price for it. I will sacrifice my life as the Lamb of God slain for the forgiveness of the sins of all the world for all of those who will believe in me. See, Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. Jesus gave his life for our sins. He gave his life for our sins. You must understand... They didn't take Jesus' life. It wasn't just a group of evil people that took the life of Jesus. Jesus could have called down a host of angels and been delivered from the entire situation. But Jesus laid his life down sacrificially to say, I will take the penalty for the sins of the whole world upon myself. It was sacrificial. It was substitutionary. That is, he took my place and he took your place. We deserve to die. That's why this message is so very important. And then there was this moment three days later when Jesus came up out of the grave again. And you and I must understand, this is the heartbeat, the essence of Christianity. Do we believe that Jesus is alive? Do we believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Because if we don't believe that, then the gospel has no power. But we know that our Redeemer, our Savior, is the one that death could not hold. Death could not capture him and keep him in the grave. Because of his power, he rose victoriously. So the message that we have is a message that... Our Redeemer lives, and He lives forever. And I'm as sure that Jesus is alive as I am sure I'm standing on this stage today. I'm as sure of that. And if I had time today, I, I, I wish I could take you through all the reasons I believe in the resurrection. But I'm telling you, there's tremendous proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the living Savior. And that makes Him different from anybody else, anyone who's ever lived. Show me someone that came up out of the grave by themselves, okay? History only shows us one, and his name is Jesus. He arose from the grave. Now, this is the story. And then 40 days later, after his resurrection, he spent 40 days with his disciples, and 40 days later, he leads them to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Across the Kidron Valley, he goes up to the Mount of Ascension, and he's taken up into the clouds. They watch him go in the, into the clouds. And there are angels that attend that moment as well and look at the disciples and say, don't, you don't need to stare into heaven because the, the same Jesus that came from heaven is coming back again in the same manner. And he rose to heaven where he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And then after his ascension, 10 days later, there was the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. What an amazing moment. Read about it in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit came into that upper room in Jerusalem and came like mighty torches of fire and tongues of fire and set upon the head of the 120 believers there and the church was lit with the fire of the Spirit of the living God. And they spilled out into the streets of Jerusalem and Peter preaches a message and 3,000 people come to faith in Christ and we see this early church beginning to be birthed in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. People, the believers of God, coming alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when this happened, as we've talked about recently, that set in motion the last days. Because, in fact, that was the prophecy of Joel in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so now we're living in the last days. What last days are we living in? I don't know which last days we're living in. Is the last of the last days? I don't know. I'm telling you it's... More last days than it used to be. Okay? Amen? And tomorrow will be more more last days than it used to be. Okay? But we're living in the last days and the season of time when we need to get to the world the same message that you and I have received. There's good news for our broken world. Amen? Amen. The church, please listen to me. This is not in my notes, but I want to say it because I want you to hear it today. The church needs to be a messenger, not of bad news. The church needs to be the messenger of good news to a broken world. Amen? There's, there's far too much bad news in our world. If we're not careful as believers, we can fall into the pattern of mouthing the bad news. 
oh, this is bad and that's bad and that politician bad and well, that one's worse and we fill in all the blanks there and everything's bad, 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 bad. Let me tell you something. In the midst of all the badness, there still is a good news message that God has called us to proclaim until this happens, until Jesus comes back again. Amen? Okay. And there will be a second coming of Jesus. There will be a time when the trumpets will sound and Christ will return. And in that moment, we'll be caught with him. And the dead in Christ will rise. And there will be this amazing second coming of Messiah, which will then set in motion the final judgment. And the final judgment will happen. And that will be the moment where two things will occur. The books will be opened and then the books will be closed. The, books, the, the book of life will be open. And all those whose names are in the book of life will spend eternity. As I'll mention in just a moment with our Savior and our Redeemer. And those whose names are not in the book of life, those names are closed off for separation from God for all eternity. But there will be a final judgment. There will be a moment when justice will finally be done in our world. The judge will establish final judgment and justice. And then for those who are followers of Christ, and I love this, there will be a, the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. And that establishment will be with Jesus, our Messiah, our King, our Lord. And he will rule and reign over all of his redeemed children who have trusted him as Savior. I'm looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Aren't you? Okay. And let me tell you something else. Are you hearing me today? Anybody hearing some good news this morning? Okay. Are you hearing some good news today? In the new heaven and in the new earth, you're going to have a new body, okay? You're going to have a new body, okay? That old knee is not going to hurt like it used to, okay? Your migraines are going to be gone forever. Cancers will be dissolved for all eternity, amen, okay? All those things that we struggle with under the curse of a broken world, will now be in a new age, the age of the new heaven and the new earth, and we will rule and reign with Christ forever and forever. This is the good news. It's not just one little moment in this story of shepherds out in the field. No, it's the setting in motion of the most amazing events of history leading to this final moment in our lives as well. Now, here's the key question for you. Are you ready for all this? Here's what I want to talk to you just for a moment from my heart. I want you to listen really closely today because perhaps what I've said before is not going to be any more important than what I'm going to say right now. It would be really a terrible shame for you to hear the good news and never believe it for yourself. It would break my heart as, as a pastor to stand before the Lord one day and to see some of you that are walking by and you sat in church maybe even attended church regularly, maybe even served, but you never met Jesus in a personal way. You know, you can go to church and not be saved. Did you know that? Are you hearing me this morning? You can go to church and still not know Jesus. There are millions of people today that will go to church that don't know Jesus, don't have a personal relationship with Jesus because it has to be personal. That's important. It's not just enough to say, oh, it's great about the shepherds, and yeah, it's great, it's wonderful, but it has to be personal for you. And my question to you today is, have you received this message of the gospel personally? Has the good news come to you? Have you received the Savior in your life? Not just a Savior, but the Savior in your life. In fact, the Apostle John writes about this in, for, in the Gospel of John talks about people who did not receive him, but then he talks about those who did receive Christ, yet to all who did, notice this, receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I remember the time in my life, and I told this story before, and I'll tell it again very quickly here, we're, we're just about done. I remember the night in my life when I accepted Jesus. I was seven years old. And I was laying in my bed one night and I, I just couldn't go to sleep. I'd raised in church. My dad was a pastor. And so I'd heard plenty of messages by that time, okay, because we were in church all the time, okay, Sunday school classes and so forth. I heard about the gospel, but I'm laying in bed, seven years old, and I couldn't go to sleep. 
because I kept asking myself the question, am I saved? What would happen if I die? What would happen if Christ came back? Am I ready for that? And I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit down inside saying, you need to get your life right with God. Seven years old. Now, I had not done any major crimes at that point in time. Okay, okay. But I was still a sinner that needed a Savior. And I remember crying out to my dad, Dad, could you come into the room? I need to talk to you. And I'll never forget my father coming into the room and I said, Dad, I want to be saved. And he got his Bible and he walked me through the book of Romans and Romans 3.23 and Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23 and Romans 10.9, 10 and 13. If you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And my father led me into a, in a prayer that night where I opened my life to Jesus. And I can go back to that moment in time and know that night as a seven-year-old boy, my name went in the book of life, okay? My name went in the book of life. And here's, I'm not telling you that story to celebrate me. I'm asking, I'm telling you the story to ask you today. Is your name in the book of life? Not just, hey, the shepherds heard that. What an amazing man. Oh, we love Christmas. It's awesome. No. Have you received the Savior yourself? And if you've not received him, don't reject him. He is the risen Savior, the coming King. And today, today can be your day to receive him in your life. It changes everything. It changes everything. It puts you on a whole different track of loving God, not because of the works you do, because of a heart that's been changed inside. See, one more thing I want to say. I'm going to be done. Works will not save you. Being a good person is not going to get you to heaven. Did you know that? It won't get you to heaven. Because you can never be good enough to be perfect. And so if you want to work your way to heaven, you've got to be perfect. Okay? Because that's the only way you'll get there. And that's by being as perfect as God is. That's, that's the only acceptance. Jesus was perfect. That's why he is our Savior. Because our faith is in him. And he gives us the gift of his righteousness that allows us in. Okay? So that's how I go. Not by what I've done, but by his grace. Okay? That's the difference. And so if you're saying, well, I'll just be a good person and God's going to let me in. No. What gets you into heaven is one thing and one thing only. Receiving Christ with faith in your heart and believing that he's enough. He is your Savior. And we're saved by his grace. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray today? Fathers, we've taken this time to reflect upon the shepherds in Bethlehem and the news that came to them and the application of this to our lives. We want to make sure that each one of us today, Lord, understand the importance in our own individual lives today. To remember that moment, Lord, and to be able to have that moment with you where we invite you to become Lord and Savior of our lives. And Lord, I pray today for anyone that's within the sound of my voice here in this room or at our Frederick campus or anyone that's watching online that has not settled that issue with you. God, I ask you that just like I experienced that so many years ago in that moment of salvation, Lord, I pray that today they would open their lives to you and receive you as Lord and Savior of their life. Thank you that the message is for everyone. Help us not to disqualify ourselves from it, but to receive and believe. We ask it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm asking no one be moving around, looking about the next few moments, very quiet, very still. If you've never received Christ in your life and you want to do that today, you can do it right now. This could be your moment. I'm not going to embarrass you, not going to do anything to draw, to, to draw attention to you. I just want to help you right now find Jesus, and I'll do that through prayer. And I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. If you'll pray it sincerely, it's not a magic prayer. Please understand this. It's not some magic incantation. You need to be sincere as you pray this prayer. But if you'll pray it sincerely, Jesus will hear you. And this can be your day that you'll mark down and say, Today was my day of salvation. Right where you are right now, just whisper this prayer with me. Mean it from your heart. Say, Jesus, go ahead and whisper his name, Jesus. You're going to talk to him. You 
not talking to me, you're talking to him. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm so sorry for all the things I've done wrong, for all of my sins. I know I'm a sinner, God, in need of a Savior. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God, the Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. Just tell him right now, Jesus, I believe in you. Now pray this prayer. Say, Lord, come into my life right now. Invite him in. Say, come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. Today, I turn my life over to you. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for each person that just prayed that prayer. Thank you that you've heard them. Thank you that the promise of your word is very clear. You say, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I pray for each one of these that have reached out to you in prayer, that you'll remind them that today has been a life-changing day. Help them now to grow in you, follow you, and serve you faithfully from this day forward. We ask it again in your precious name. Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and welcome some people to God's family today. And I know there are some of you that prayed that prayer. And at the end of the service, I'll tell you more about a gift that we have for you. But today is the first weekend of the month. We normally celebrate communion together. And so if you'll go ahead and get your communion elements in your hand. And if you need a communion element, the hosts are uh, passing among us right now to uh, make sure that you have that available before you just raise your hand. They'd love to serve you there. So anyone that needs that, you might have to sort of wave at them a little bit because sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, it's hard to, uh, to see everybody among all the faces there. Fantastic. If you um, have the elements in your hand, if you'll just go ahead and peel back the bottom section of it and get the wafer out, that would be wonderful. I'll prepare us to receive together in just a moment. Anybody else need a... Anybody up in the balcony? Fantastic. Great. Good. There we go. Why don't we stand to our feet, if you will, right now and get the uh, wafer in your hand, if you don't mind. And let's hold it up and identify right now with Jesus. And would you just take a moment and look around? Look around you a little bit. Aren't you glad you have some brothers and sisters today? Isn't it great to be in a family? See, we're, we're one loaf together. We belong to Jesus, and that's why we partake together of this bread. Lord, thank you so much that you are our bread of life. As we talked about today, that you went to the cross and you gave your life sacrificially for us so that we could be redeemed and our life be found in you. So today we eat of this bread in remembrance of you in Jesus' name. Let's eat together. Now, if you'll just peel back the little uh, tab on the top there, I'll re reveal the cup for you. And let's all just bow our heads for a moment, and maybe there's something you need to talk to God about today in your own life, a confession of a sin that you need to bring before Him, and just take a moment right now and just ask for God's forgiveness in your own heart today, wherever it might be needed. Lord, as we're about to partake of this cup together, we acknowledge the fact that we're sinners. So many times we get attitudes inside of us that are wrong, thought processes, actions, things that we say and do that hurt your heart. And God, today we come asking for your forgiveness, claiming the promise of your word that if we do confess our sins, that you are faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us through the blood of Jesus. So today we drink of this cup that representing your shed blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, let's drink together. If you're on the left-hand side of the aisle, there should be a brown bag that's still remaining there. You can pick up that brown bag and drop the uh, used cup right down in that. And then, if you will, just pass it right down the aisle. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Awesome. 
Well, a few moments ago, I know that we had a number of people that gave their lives to Jesus. We just once once again want to welcome you to the family of God today. We're so happy for the decision that you've made to follow Christ. And we want to give you a copy of this book. If you prayed to receive Jesus before you leave, you need this little book in your hand. It's called A New You. It's our gift to you. It'll help you know how to get started in your walk with Christ. It's very easy to get. Just find the person that's closest to you. Walk up and say, hey, I prayed with the pastor. And get a copy of it on the way out before you go. If you're new here this weekend, again, very glad to have you. Take a moment at the end of the service. Head right over to meet and greet to my right. There's a hospitality room over to my right there as well. And there's some wonderful people that would love to say hi to you. I'm going to be there in about five or six minutes to say hi to you as well. Well, now would you receive today's blessing as you go. Now may God Almighty, the God of good news, may He fill you with hope and expectation that you'll walk this week in confidence and assurance that you're not walking alone. God is with you. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen.